uh, people are interested able to join us as we move this on. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the uh, October roundtable uh, discussion for SEMRI. Uh, today's, will be today's discussion will be focusing on the creative industries and how they are repositioning the, the African brand. Uh, we, we have uh, three, five speakers with us today. Uh, please, if you are not speaking, can you mute yourself, please? Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Jennifer Bosa, she's a senior lecturer in media and communication from the University of Bedfordshire in the UK. We've got Andrea Chika Chuku, uh, who is a producer and a filmmaker. And we've got Professor Namdi Madichi, who is a professor of marketing and entrepreneurship at the University of Kigali in Rwanda. We've got Dr. Izu Uwako, who is a, a research fellow at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz in Germany. And we also have uh, Mr. Obina Okere Kocha, who is the creative director of, of Red TV. So the agenda for today is for us to have a conversation first around uh, the individual speakers. We have the floor to give us their own perspective, their own insights, and perhaps what they think about the industry uh, so far. And then we'll be going on to some individual questions and we will be, we, we will be uh, engaging more in the conversation and that will be followed up by, by the a question and answer session whereby we will open the floor for questions and also we will be uh, rounding up with some set of questions for, for, for our speakers. So hopefully we plan to finish by by, by five o'clock, yes. And also this, this meeting is recorded, so we'll be sharing it on, on YouTube. And uh, perhaps that will also start with, uh, follow, that will sort of continue the, the conversation. So my name is uh, Emmanuel Mogaji. I'm the president for, for SEMRI. And it's my pleasure to also introduce uh, Mary, Dr. Mary Okadigwe, who will be our host for today and also uh, Dr. Chus Okoli, who is the project manager for our, our roundtable discussion. I see Dr. Mary Okago is there. Can you take over, please? Are you here? Dr. Mary. Wow. Okay. Uh, in the absence, uh, since I think she's having a technical problem, so please allow me to uh, invite uh, Andrea uh, Chikachuku, who is uh, a film producer, and uh, she's very versatile in the creative industry in Nigeria. And uh, it would be nice for her to share some insight and some perspective into our uh, experience uh, so far. It's a pleasure having her on board, like to, to really gain some insight from, from her. So, uh, Andrea, please, would you be able to start the conversation and give us some insight into your experience and how you think the creative industry is shaping the industry? So, the floor is yours, please, if you can uh, come in. Hi everyone. My name is Hello. Andrea Chika Chuku. I'm just said it's uh, it's Andrea, or you can call me Chika. Um, Chika. Yes, really. Yeah. So, um, in terms of insight, you know, when we say insight, uh, we have to remember that Africa is we are massive. Africa is a big continent, and we have all these countries and different languages, we're constantly struggling amongst ourselves to know ourselves better, to understand better us as a people as before the external. Um, it has been my experience coming from uh, Nollywood that that is partially what our issue is. And if you look at just the general basics of everyday living anyways, you will find that in Africa, our basic struggle is accommodating each other, which without just being, you know, upfront with all the issues in the world, that doesn't happen with the West. As much as there are differences in all of that, 
you will find that the, the West is more accommodating of themselves. So I think our first basic issue um, as Africans is to learn more accommodation and develop more ways to work together in spite of our differences. Uh, that at a key, you know, at the bottom level for me is the most uh, integral thing. And in Nollywood, we try every day, as you can see with our films or TV production, to develop that and to get started on pushing that agenda. Um, but if you look at Africa in general, in terms of music, they've gone, the music industry has gone way further than film in pushing you know, the African brand. If you look at South Africa, look at Nigeria, Kenya, um, there's a bunch of artists from everywhere, Senegal, uh, the Congo, the, these great artists doing brilliant things and raising the bar in terms of what um, they do. And I could give a few names of the artists who generally right now are ranking and comparing, sorry, everyone, when I look to this side, I'm looking at my um, notes. So um, give me a moment. I was going to share this, but then I thought, let me not crowd every uh, thing we're discussing today. But when we look at people like, let me give an instance. When we look at people like, uh, Burner Boy from Nigeria now, and he's called the African giant and all of that. And we see the impact with the last five concerts he's done across the world. You then have an understanding of how African music has arrived. Now, he is not the first African to have made this kind of impact. Fela did. And you have people like Yusuf Undo, who has. Uh, but now at the stage where you have the Gen Z group Burner Boy is doing brilliant. You've got Diamond uh, Platinum, who is from Tanzania. Boy, listen, they are doing good business and they're putting Africa on the map. It's not just about being African now to love African music. Everybody loves African music. If you've looked at TikTok recently, doesn't matter where you're from. You're playing the music, you're enjoying the music and you're more like vibing, getting to know the people more. So there's a trend of, oh, what African food to eat? Everybody's doing that. It's the new thing to push your video. So I would say generally so far, the music people are way ahead in terms of how we use create our creative, um, our creative works to push the African brand. Film can do more and we can get in depth into that further um, as we have the conversation. But so far, um, that's my idea. And I think that the divide for us as filmmakers mainly is our diversity, which should actually make us, bring us more together. But our diversity and differences seem to be um, a bigger issue on the table. Um, and that's it, I, unless you have, Emmanuel, unless you have any other uh, question at the moment. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Miss Andrea. I'll be, um, um, that, was, that was a nice um, presentation you made on um, the role of, um, on the developments and some of the, um, just a quick uh, uh, highlights on the uh, African theme and music and movie industry. I I'll just ask you a few questions before we go on. Um, okay. Yeah, so when you look at the content that we bring out, you know, from, from Nigeria, from Africa, and um, how that resonates with um, society, do you feel that um, um, Africa as a whole, do you think um, uh, we are, um, when you look when you when you look at the global stage now, how how well do you think um, our music, our movies, our entertainment industry, how well do you think they are projecting um, us, you know, on the global stage? Do you feel there is still uh, some uh, disconnect disconnect between the content we produce and what the global audience 
uh, uh, what resonates with the global audience? Okay, so for me, I wrote down something. So I was just looking for it, right? And I know that there will be a few people at this discussion who agree totally with what I'm about to say. And some people might differ, but here's my opinion. I think as Africans, we're focusing too much on what the global view is, what every other person is thinking about us, as opposed to what we think of ourselves. Um, a filmmaker that I know a few people here would know, it, Tyler Perry, said that whilst every other person's focus was to get the attention of Hollywood, he focused on his audience. It was about his people. It was about them recognizing that the content was made for them and they felt involved. And the stories that were being told weren't stories of the life they could live. It was the stories of the lives that they were living and they could recognize themselves in these stories. So at the award he won, he goes, as much as he appreciates the award and everybody, every now and then, if you're around Hollywood, you hear, oh, nobody takes Tyler Perry seriously. Well, his people take him seriously enough and he's become a billionaire doing that. I think fundamentally as Africans, the perception of how we are supposed to be seen globally is shrouding what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on telling our stories. Do you know our population? Let's just put it out there. Our population at the moment, if we focus on ourselves, for ourselves, see the world is coming nonetheless. That's something that um, as a child, my mom used to say, it doesn't matter where you are right now. Things will continue to evolve and change, okay? It's just about as you grow, where you find yourself and how you make use of it. So whether the world, we were sitting in Africa and we got colonized, okay? Just, just Let's just play that. We are still in Africa and they're still coming because if we're doing well, guess what? It's like a business. If you're doing well in your business, people will come you will get customers. So I think it's more about us fixing our house as opposed to how the globe sees us. It's more about the continent for me. I think we should be more focused about how we as a continent work together. So um, I'll talk about this later, but as I think we are at the cusp of where we should be discussing seriously co-production treaties across Africa you know, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria. But like we know, all of these things have an undertone of politics to it. So whilst we're waiting for those tables to turn and for it to arrive, I think we are at the verge where we should be discussing collaborations. There are different ways of doing these things without us getting or waiting for all of those things to be signed. And for me, that should be our focus. And the globe will come. Look at where we are now, right now with Netflix, with Amazon Prime. You know, uh, before the end of next year, Paramount Plus will arrive. Um, HBO, they're making their deals in the background. And these are the ones that I know are at the moment. Hulu, there's a lot going on. And they're getting in there with force because, you know, once Amazon Prime and Netflix arrive, everybody's going to get there. Disney is arriving also this year. Uh, and they're starting by, um, you know, the release of Black Panther 2 uh, at the African International Film Festival in November. So as to whether the globe knows we're here, they do. So I think we should position ourselves for ourselves first. That would be my perspective. And uh, thank you for that beautiful response. We, um, I'll just um, maybe follow up with one or two more questions before we move on to the next speaker. Um, okay. I, I like your point of view and your perspective, you know, on how uh, we should not get carried away by uh, what by the by uh, the world. We should uh, we have a lot of heritage. We have rich African heritage, which if we pack it very well, we can project this globally, you know, and there will be high demand, you know. So um, the, the, this takes me on to the next question, you know. Um, in um, when you see the trends, you know, uh, the trends of what comes out from our industry. Uh, when you compare that with, um, there's this common notion, you know, that um, our value systems, um, our rich culture and everything is being eroded gradually uh, 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 by westernization and uh, so many other things. Um, so do you think that um, 
Nollywood, our music industry, our movies, do you think that um, our media practitioners too, do you think that um, there has been that erosion of African value systems, African culture in trying to, you know, in the quest for uh, globalization or in trying to be seen as being harmonious with the global stage? Do you feel that there is a risk or threat of erosion or devaluation of our culture, our languages, and so many other things? I think everybody, most cultures in the world have gone through that scare. But here's the thing, though. Whatever will happen will happen. And I don't think it rests solely on the creative industry. I don't think with African music, there's anything being lost because most of our artists are singing in Pigeon, Igbo, Yoruba, Hauser, and a mix, uh, Zulu, Swahili. So I don't think the music industry is doing uh, badly. In terms of the film, I'm glad you said that. You see, when people are making films, they're making films for people who will buy them. And this creates the issue, the distribution issue and the collaboration issue I'm saying, and that solves this if we get it right. But so I hear you with, are we getting too westernized with our films or our content, our TV content? Maybe, maybe not. It comes down to who's paying for the film. If Netflix, a company that is stayed in stations in the United States, is paying for your content, there's a specific kind of content they, they want on their platform. Period. That's just all it is. That there it's not that there are not no people out there making content about our culture and about following our values. But you're not seeing them on Netflix. And that's because. A, we don't have any co-production treaties. If you look, you'll see some South African, go ahead, you check, you'll see some South African and Kenyan films where you see some of our culture come through. And those are big budget films because they're funded properly. The producers are not busy trying to fund from their pocket. So you have to remember that a lot of African productions are self-funded. Most of Nollywood is, everybody knows that, you know, most producers fund their own product, their own projects. So that thing, the budget, the film budget, the money, the funding for it is a great problem for a lot of African producers. That supports all of these things that you're saying. So if, if most people are getting grants of a significant amount to make sure, and it's, they're not, profit driven you see there that those are different levels also that people don't understand it, it's saying you give people money or there's money with the bank of industry and all of that but most of those loans are profit driven if a producer is making a film to put on a platform or to distribute a certain way they have to bear in mind the profitability that is required to refund that and to continue making films because it's a business for the producer. So I think that once we fix our funding in terms of how we, we get funding for making our stories, the dynamics about what kind of stories we see will change. But yes, there is more that we can do. And at just the, uh, uh, the grassroots level, I think it, it's something that we might need to imbibe or get down to doing again, depending on who's working with who. Things like competitions, which used to happen when I was a, a younger kid in the late 70s and um, early 80s. It's just imbibing the same thing we did with the inter-house inter -house sports uh, games thing, which they used to pull people for sports. It's do a lot more. I did that as a kid, which was a lot of drama, drama competitions, try to pull all of these big African corporations that have all this money and then pull out some of their CSR and fund these kids, fund these schools, give them funds, fund those competitions and fund apprenticeships, sponsored apprenticeships that help in the industry. Those are other ways to keep it going so that we're seeing more of those stories. Uh, wow, thanks a lot. That's very rich, rich insight. So there is definitely a business side to it. Yeah. I, think, I think it's similar to what you see when people ambassed multinationals for um, sponsoring um, 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 
um, for sponsoring music artists and um, those in the entertainment industry. And mm -hmm. the ambassador, um, they say, why don't you go sponsor uh, the um, uh, those who are the uh, the young students who are um, winning prizes in, in school competitions and all of that, you know. Mm -hmm. But they've forgotten that it's a bit it's a bit business, and um, the, yeah. the, the person who is investing his money, he has a lot of. Uh, uh, he has He's looking for an ROI. Yes. Return of investors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He has a scene where he wants to. It's, it's not a charity organization, you know. That's yeah. the that's the hash fruit. Uh, thanks a lot, Miss Andrea. Um, Miss Andrea is um, uh, just to add that she is the CEO and executive producer at First Clockwise Film Production, uh, a seasoned uh, actor, experienced pro producer, and consultant for film festivals, and she has a rich um, profile. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we can come back with more questions later. Okay. I I'll quickly move on to Mr. Kerry Kocha. Um, um, he also has a rich profile, and um, I will just summarize. He's a creative director, um, art director, multimedia artist, music for film composer, a documentary filmmaker, AV editor, graphics production designer. He's also a musician, a creative copywriter, and an entrepreneur. Um, he has spent over a decade in the Nigerian advertising and design space and has had the opportunity of building Nigerian super brands from an art direction and content creation perspective. Uh, he has a very rich profile and um, which which uh, we put out on our LinkedIn uh, post. So um, I'll just quickly um, um, go straight to the point and ask Mr. Perry to uh, take over and um, give us his own perspective on how um, the creative industries in Africa, you know, as a whole, how they can, um, you know, how they can reposition Africa to, uh, you know, to be the Africa that we all want to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shooks, and thanks, thanks for having me, and thanks to everybody for joining. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, when I start to hear all of that, I'm like, is that really me? It's like, it's like, <laughs> like an imposter or something. Yeah. It's great to be here. I, you know, <laughs> talking about you know a, a subject that's really you know great, uh, close to my heart, and my the creative industries, the creative sector, and how that can reposition Africa. I, I think that. It's very clear to see that, um, you know, like like Andrea was saying, you know, um, Africa, there's something that's going on on our continent and it's been going, this has been happening since, you know, you could almost say like, you know, before the pandemic or after the pandemic. And it's really great because there's, there's, there's a serious explosion of, of um, you know, uh, a creative renaissance of sorts. And it's across board and it's not just in one thing. You look at our fashion, you see how that's beginning to get, ex, you know, exported across the world. I mean, we can't we can't talk enough about our music. We're talking about, you know, our artists doing billions of streams on on Spotify on Boomplay. It's Apple Music, you know, and you know, and of course the burgeoning um, what's happening in Hollywood and our film. You know, I I just look at my notes. It's, it's the revival of the sun kissed continent, or typically sub-Saharan Africa, is riding on a single theme: pride. I think that. For a very long time, we've been, you know, um, I, I like I, you know, I was having a session yesterday and I was talking about something similar. And, you know, for a very long time in the 70s, 80s, and probably perhaps the 90s, you know, we, we were pretty much invaded by American culture, by European culture. You know, it was very, very, very pervasive in how we dressed. In the music kind of music that we, you know, we had, our, we, I mean, we had, I mean, I mean, talk about our fruit beat and the, and the high life in the 70s. You know, highlight from Ghana, Fernando Colapo, Kuti, Rex Lossing. I mean, we have a rich history of musicians, but you know, what started to happen in the 80s and the 90s was there was this huge, you know, um, invasion of hip hop. And that carried on. And we started to see a lot of that in the fashion, you know, our fashion and our, our teenagers, you know, and things like that. Even when we watch The Godfather, you know, those Italian suits, you see other people <laughs> that kind of thing. So we had that, we had that, we had that thing going on in, in you know, and everything was American, well, you know, in the days of, Beta Max and VHS. When we watched those films, it was like everybody wanted to, a slice of America, the American experience. You know, you watched all those films and you thought, okay, you know, that's how we wanted to be. But look at what's happening now. You know, we're all speak singing from the same hymn sheet. We all are pro Africa. You know, we, we you know, that kind of thing. There's, you know, I mean, in the last two, three, four years, there's been this sort of mass return for African-Americans who are trying to trace their roots back to Africa. So there's a sense of pride in trying to, you know, identify with the continent, you know. There's something called 
I, I stumbled across something called Afri renewal, like an Afri renewal, and like you know, like renewing, you know, like an African renewal. You know, it's often on the line with the spirit of Pan Africanism, with more countries collaborating by the need to celebrate and grow the African way. You know, um, according to you know, an executive uh, um, a director at Nielsen, she says that you know the doubling down of Africa's burgeoning middle class. That is pretty much what is responsible for what's happening. You know, and we're currently at three to 500 million people. I will be, you know, rather would be 300 to 500 million middle-class people by 2030, you know. And economic reviewers are calling this the Afropolitan revolution, you know. Um, you know, my, uh, Andrea's like a professional colleague. And, uh, you know, an example of, of, of this from visual perspective is what's happening in, in, in Hollywood. You know, we are now looking at a period where we're looking at themes and titles and stories that are Afrocentric. You know, this was not something that, you know, I think for a very long time, um, African magic as, you know, as a super brand that has been, you know, appropriating a lot of culture in the content, have been pushing. So we're all, we're all familiar with African magic, you know, and, and a lot of all those low budget movies. But now, and we remember how we used to frown upon them and how we used to like look down about it. Oh, this is not, this is not what I wanted to identify with, et cetera. But, you know, that those things were things that were exported, you know, like we had when the internet wasn't so rife, people would take DVDs, VCDs abroad in, in Ghana must go bags. And you know, but now we're at a place where we're openly celebrating celebrating them. I'm gonna mention to me, I mean, we've we also we all we also I mean Kolako by you know by Kulia Falaria, and we all celebrate how it is possible to tell your story using global standards, you know, in terms of technicalities, you know, VFX, audio, you know, like, and things like that, you know, and really tell your story. And I think that this is pretty much where the crux of the matter is. How are we able to tell our stories? How are we able to own our own narratives? That I think this is where the crux of the matter is. I think even, you know, beyond just understanding and coming together, understanding each other, how are we able to do that? I mean, if, if, if a serious case in point is what happened with Sony and the Woman King, you know, you would think that a story like that should be front and center happening in Africa on the continent by African producers, directors, executive producers, but no. And the funny thing about it is that these guys took a bet. They were not particularly crazy about putting it was if it just, it just cost under hundred million dollars. It cost fifty million dollars to make that film, and it was all shot in South Africa. You know, for those who don't know, and but it surprised all of them because this is an authentic story about what had happened in the Dahomey Kingdom. You know, I, I know that there are a lot of arguments about whether it was accurately captured or not, but that's not it. That's not the discussion. The point here is that we need to own a narrative. It's very, very, very important. Like what we're doing. Like I think the music case is a very, very good example of how we've been able to own what is ours in terms of our dance movements, in terms of our rhythms, in terms of, you know, what is unique to the African continent in terms of sound, in terms of, yeah, exactly, you know, in terms of, you know, our, 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 our dance language and you know, things like that, you know, I feel that we need to operate from a point of authenticity because you cannot, you cannot be what you're not. You cannot give what you don't have, you know, and, and, and people need to understand that what we have is authentic. You know, we have a culture that has spanned for thousands of years, even before colonization, you know, you know, I, I, I as, as somebody who practiced the arts, you know, I look at what is happening in contemporary fine arts and people don't know that we have move, art movements that date 6,000 years ago. We're looking at the, you know, knock art. And, and for those people who are in the art, um, the, art, the art industry, they would know that sometime in the seventies, Pablo Picasso went to see an African exhibition and he noticed that it, some sculptural pieces were there were, you know, essentially reduced to geometric shapes. And he was looking at a knock head, a terracotta head from Nigeria triangular eyes, you know, a, you know, triangular eyes, triangular nose, just broken down into symmetric, simple geometric shapes. And that is how cubism was born. Because he went, because this is somebody who, he, he you know, he's Spanish, 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 Spanish master, you know, Spanish art, um, his father was a Spanish, um, Spanish um, art, artist, and he went to art school, traditional European art school. But he saw that, but that started a revolution and he started to decompose his figures in his drawing and things like that. That inspiration came from an African knockhead. So the point is, why are Africans not seeing the richness of your culture and celebrating it? You know, how many artists even know about the knock art movement, Ibuku from the East? How many of them know about the, you know, and the origins of these things, you know? All we know is that, look, you know, in, there was an expedition in 1894 and the British came and cut away 
things from. And it's so they're looking at foreign porn. Like if you go to the National Gal Gallery of Art in, in, in you know in, in in London, you would see a lot of that stuff, and of course scattered around Europe. But they don't know the origins of those things. So my the point I'm trying to make here is that you know Africa has always been in a continent beaming and brimming with pride, with, 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 with talent, with a lot of great things. I think now we're beginning to get into a point where we're beginning to see those things, we're beginning to embrace who we are and what we are, what we should stand for, you know? I think there are, I think in, in doing this, there are some attendant problems. I think that, you know, we cannot lose sight of. Africa is brimming with talent, with influence and reach of African artists and creatives. Now, global due to use of social media, digital streaming services. The continent's creative sector is gaining momentum and interest. But what does this mean for the sector that is often overlooked and untapped? You know, there, there, it's, there's so much that we've not been able to tap into. You know? The African continent is struggling to find an economic model that ensures sustainable growth, mainly because of the size and lack of organization of national markets due to the insufficient organization of national and regional markets and incentive policy and a sizable offer of the African continent. The absence of appropriate public policies also hinders the potential of development of the African continent. So we're at a point where we have this great product that we have, whether you want to call it our culture, whatever you want to call it the appropriation of what we have in terms of our music, our film, our fashion. How do we even bring put it in a place where it's marketable? You know, like something Andrea said, I, I, I'm sorry, like we should forget this opinion about what the West thinks about us and focus on ourselves. You know, we're not even putting the premium on ourselves. And if you don't do that, how? because what's happening now is we're not having the, um, uh, you know, I want the democratization of African stories by big executives in Hollywood. You know, that's what's happening. You know, I, I always, I always, I always remind people something. You know, like you know, we all talk about the 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 the, the big big um, what what Black Panther did for the world in 2018 and things like that. But people seem to forget that it's a. I grew up reading graphic novels, so Black Panther was created by Stan Lee and a bunch of other artists in the 1960s. It's been there. It's not new. So I think because Hollywood decided to make a film about it, of course, you know, they decided to turn all of all these graphic novels into the Avengers, Iron Man, Thor, etc., into motion picture. The comic has always been there, but yeah, until it became a feature film, that's where, oh, okay, there's this thing called Black Panther. But the comics have been there since the 60s. Yeah, I'm sure most people don't know this, but what am I trying to say? We need to get to a point where we're, you know, where we are very, very aware, that, where's that, where there's that consciousness of what we have. Now, it's a rapidly growing sector, you know, that can, that can boost uh, the economies of Africa, you know, um, drive social economic development, a significant contribution of 3% to the global domestic product, you know, GDPs highlights the economic potential of the creative industries as a source of growth. Now, uh, Einstein Young in 20, um, 2005 says that, you know, the economic potential of creative industries can be a source of job creation. In Nigeria alone, creative industries contributed approximately 18 billion US dollars. This is a report by the World Bank in 2020. Now, um, let, let me let me sort of focus on what Nollywood is doing, which is essentially, you know, what I'm a, I'm a part of. You know, um, Nollywood has grown. You know, if you think about um, watching films in four by three for, for, for those who understand technicalities and before high definition, you know, bad sound, bad audio, but there was something intriguing about the story. The stories captivated you. Now, um, in 2002, um, a New York Times journalist called um, Norimichi Onishi essentially coined the word Nollywood. Nollywood was not coined by a Nigerian, it was coined by a Japanese, American Japanese writer who was writing for the New York Times in 2002. And essentially, he, he came to Nigeria to observe filmmaking activity and you know, essentially looked at how we're making films. And he was intrigued by that process, you know, you know, with second highest behind, um, and I, at, at some point he was behind um, Hollywood. Now, Bollywood is not biggest, followed by Nollywood then Hollywood, you know. And he was intrigued by how we, our turnaround times in a week we had churned out several films, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, he said called it Nollywood, nothing would. The N stands for nothing, not Nigeria, not nothing would. Films made from nothing, essentially. But look at where we are now. Hollywood, you, you know, you, you are in Los Angeles, you are in wherever you are in Latam, you know, APAC, wherever you are, Asia, Asia Pacific, Latin America, and, you know, and you can watch a film made by Muabudu or Kunle Afolayo or, you know, Bolan Osti Peters or by Sidio Fari Obasi. It's, we've now come to a point where our content is now globalized. We are now 
on the top, you know, you see when a lot of people who have put their stuff on Netflix, when they talk about, oh, we're top 10 in XYZ regions, you know, that's where we are now. It's a great quantum leap, but it is taking blood, sweat and tears. And, you know, it is taking some time, but we need to appreciate how far we've come, you know, but then again, it, you know, I think there are areas where we need to actually strengthen, you know, like for instance, UNESCO says that the African film industry contributes you know, could con could contribute twenty billion dollars to the continent's revenues, and also employ twenty million Africans. Remember when I said that the lots of potential is untapped. This is the potential that we're looking at. This is what it takes to rebrand Africa and to create that new consciousness that you are talking about. You know, um, how can the creative industries reposition the African brand? I think that we need to deepen the use of technology as an enabler across the value chain for creativity. You know, uh, what is really great about technology is the fact that, I mean, there's a time when, you know, the internet seemed like something that was a billion years away. Now it's in the palm of your hands, you know, literally. Now you can publish yourself. You, you can put together a podcast, Record it on your phone and you set up a Spotify account, put it out there, it's out there, you know, and things like that. Now you have YouTube analytics where you can go and talk about, you know, you can see with the push of a button who was listening to your content, what part of the world were listening to your content from. I mean, this was never possible before, but technology has made that possible, you know. Of course, we're all familiar with streaming platforms. So we I think that you know we need to embrace technology. Now we're talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, I was reading an article some you know uh, the other day and how the New York Times, where it said that about 30 to 40% of his articles were written by, was written by artificial intelligence. Now we're talking about, is, you know, like I'm an artist, you know, and, and I'm always trying to push, you know, the frontiers of creativity. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a trained painter from University of Nigeria, but I've now embraced creating art using AI, just from prompts, from prompts, you know? I, I, I can type in Biafran soldier, Future be a futuristic Biafran soldier from 2050. And it gives me a visual representation of what it's gonna look like. You know, I'm sorry, concept artist, but it looks like your jobs are all. <laughs> but my point is now I can create a film, I can do a deck for a film, and just by thinking and putting my thoughts down, I already have a, a, a concept board or a mood board for what I want to create. That's how technology is helping creativity. And I think we need to embrace it. You know, I think funding a government level to develop in the enabling environment, because the trick about it is that, you know, you know, Andrea mentioned something again, tax rebates, we need to be in a place where there are grants and those things that like, look at Canada, every, you know, a lot of all the provinces in Canada have grants specifically tailored to filmmakers to create, I mean, it's, it's you know, I was, I was in Cannes in May and all of these guys were all in Cannes, you know, just talking to people, saying, look, this grant is available, if you, you know, it's, it was just, you know, and down in South Africa, in, in Africa here, KwaZulu-Natal has a film commission that is urging people to come to South Africa and make films. You get, you know, discounts on this, rebates and things like that. So I think if we start to replicate those models across the continent, we can begin to see a very, very huge difference, you know? And again, um, apart from developing the, you know, enabling environment, the relevant infrastructure, you know, in, in imagine a scenario where government, you know, gives grants for people to procure film equipment at a discounted price and things like that, you know, treaties with governments and say, okay, look, okay, Japan, makers of Sony, makers of Panasonic, let's sign this trade agreement. You know, I know that we have, we have Canon here now, we have Sony here now, but I mean, imagine if it were something where two countries had a handshake, you know, things like that would really make things great happen you know really well for 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 creators at large you know and i must say you know um i, I really have to thank you know the likes of people like google you know who have really really made a lot of investment in that space youtube how they've empowered creators to do really big things you know and spotify a bunch of other companies facebook you know meta they've actually made some significant investments in the but they're, they're not enough we need more we're talking about our population where we have over two in nigeria alone over 220 million people that are underserved in terms of content offerings we have so much to do you know then of course creative entrepreneur support you know um the, we cannot overlook the power of entrepreneurship and a lot of all these creatives are entrepreneurs in their own right i think that you know having some sort of planner to support them that's one way to actually push and create that consciousness that ground swell for you know for us to actually begin to reap the benefits and really begin to um, push and, and and make i think there's a lot and i think that you know content creation has a really huge part to, big part to play in rebranding and positioning africa for it to take its proper place in the world so thank you very much thank you very much mr obinna you you uh 
that was a huge dose, you know, that you dropped for us. I, I was, I was writing down, uh, you know, my whole, my notes is just full of, uh, you know, I was taking down some points. That was a lot that you uh, really rolled out. So it's very nice. I, I, I like the part where you talked about we need to own our narrative. You know, you talked about the um, the woman king. You know, and then you know there's some issue about whether it's historically accurate. So it's almost like um, we have a rich heritage, we have a lot of content, but we don't seem to uh, know how to project that uh, 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 forward. And um, those um, um, those from other parts of the world, they are seeing these uh, treasures that we have. And they know how to they know how to mine it, so they come and they yeah. So it, it's 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 almost uh, similar to what we the situation we have in Africa, where we have a lot of natural resources like food oil and so many other natural resources, and then we export them in the raw form, and then they are refined outside the shores of Africa and even uh, uh, brought back. It's almost like uh, cocoa and chocolate. We we sell we sell we export cocoa in its raw form, you know, at this perhaps a very a not too good price, and then in the in the West they refine it into chocolates, and then people are probably paying maybe like ten times, <laughs> um, more than ten times the price of the cocoa. So I think it's the same thing with um, you know the creative industry. Yeah, thanks a lot for that rich insights. Yeah, there are so many questions that uh, that uh, that could pop up from what you said. I would just ask one or two. So in, in terms of owning the narrative, you know, um, do you feel that, um, because there is something that uh, one would notice when you look at history um, and our culture in Africa, um, when you go to different parts of the world, you will see, um, um, for example, if you look at the Asians, if you go to different parts of the world, you see that they form small, um, uh, some, some, you have some um, some citizens from this part of the world that tend to associate more with each other, even when they are in distant places. You know, do you feel that Africans and there's a disconnect? You know, um, in our I don't know in our culture, in our historical um, the way we we uh, we regard each other, even outside the shores of Africa, and does all of that affect the way we're able to come together to do big things together to you know, project it uh, globally. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that, for that really complex question. I, I think that, um, yeah, you know, um, yes, you see a sort of cohesion, um, you know, with Asians, especially, I, I think I find it, I find it very, they're, they're the prime example, you know, just Chinese and the Koreans and Japanese, they're always, you know, they're always, you know, in sync. I, I think for Africa, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I, I think for all intents and purposes, sometimes we are blinded by our pursuit of wealth and fortune. And we do this and almost at the detriment of, you know, we don't, we don't really care. And I think this whole notion that you, you must be better than your neighbor to be seen as successful is something that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a stumbling block and it's a problem, you know? And, 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 and I, I think that these are, these are things that we need to start to get rid of because at the end of the day, they don't help us and reaching our or enrich our collective, and that's you know that's 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 some of the problems that we have. You know, you see people. I hear you know even in our industry, I hear. I mean, I mean <laughs> there's, a, there's a horrible case going on right now. Of course, if you're very close to the to, <laughs> to the, you know you know the Oscars and things like that. You know, I, I think it's we just have to get to that point where we need to realize that you know I'm going to borrow the saying. You know. You know, snuffing somebody else's candle, snuff, snuffing out somebody else's candle, like it's not going to make my own shine brighter. You know, and 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 we, we you know, they say you, you you can go as far as you can alone, but you can go further together. So why can't we embrace this this spirit of togetherness and just you know? Because I tell you what, you know, the, the successes that we find in you know in other parts of the world and in other industries is because that they are measures for strength. People come together to make things happen. Nobody. Nobody, this, this, and this, this notion that, you know, I want to be the first to do that. I want to be the first, you know, we can't, it, it's, it's, it's something that's killing us. It's something that's killing us. And, 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 you know, the, when we realize that it's when we can achieve these really big things, when it comes to the better for us. So I, I think that it's a mixed bag. I mean, there are certain areas where you find some Nigerians who, you know, 
it depends on the situation, really, to be honest. You know, some you find that in some industries, some people come together, in some other industries, some people don't come together. It's it's so that's why I say it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's it's not it's not a one size fits, you know, fits fits all, you know, that kind of thing, you know. I also know that depending on wherever you're in the island world, I think a Nigerian will just be happy to see another Nigerian. You know, like imagine if you lived in Iceland or you lived in in, in Lithuania or something or Luxembourg, you know, I, I don't know how many, but the point here is that, you know, at the at the at the at the at the micro level, I, I just feel that you know there is a lot more to to achieve when we come together than when we we are not you know when we go apart you know yeah that's my yeah, take on that. You, yeah, thank you very much. I I I I think another issue is where you have our practitioners operating in silos, you know, and you have that lack of yeah. partnership and coming together. Um, that being said, uh, what do you feel are some of the for our practitioners to increase their value proposition, for them to increase their footprint on the world stage. Um, I'm thinking of things like maybe they need more management skills, more financial intelligence, you know, but let, let me ask you, what are some of those keys, some of those things you feel our practitioners need, you know, to, um, you, you talked about um, AI, artificial intelligence, you know, many, many, many of those in our industry don't know what that is and how it can even boost what they're doing. So what are some of those skills or some of those things that you feel that our practitioners need to embrace, you know, to be able to um, rebrand themselves and increase the value that they offer globally? Thank you very much, Chooks. This is, this is a, this is, this is a bread and butter subject for me. And I'm, I'm happy asking this question because I have these conversations every day. I think that the very first thing is education, education, education. Why do I say that? A lot of people just feel that, okay, um, I'm a filmmaker. I'm, I, I use that a lot because, you know, it's, that's my industry. Oh, I just want to, I just want to rap. I just want to do this. But they don't understand that what they are creating is a product. Everybody here shops, either you on, shop online or you ask um, Auntie Agnes to buy something for you when she comes back from UK or you go to shop, right? You know, everybody shops, right? And nobody likes a defective product. If you buy something on Conga or Jumia, you know, you if you buy that, you open that box and it has a defect. You there's a seven day policy, seven day return. But you will quickly return that. Oh, yeah. The same thing applies to what you create, whether it's a film, it's a podcast, it's a song, it's whatever it is. It's a book. It's a product, and people don't understand that. And that's why product management is a huge, huge, big deal in the world right now because. People need to create the right product, and that involves in, that also applies to film and creative. You know, so we need people need to understand that what they're creating is a product, and they're producing it for consumers. Now, another aspect that people need to focus on creators is audience intelligence. You are making something for people to consume. It is very important because you know, like I'm going, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I say this every time. I think that. The film industry has been invaded by interlopers who see the film industry as a cheese factory where milk goes in in one end and cheese comes out in one end. What happens in the middle, they don't care. It's a means to an end. So people are in the film industry who are not necessarily filmmakers and they're just here to have a payday. Now, people like that are not interested in the craft, in the nouse, in the nuance of filmmaking. They're not, they're not bothered. It's about, it's a way to make money, so let's make money. And that's why... When you see the product, technicality, there are problems. There are, you know, you're seeing the boom mic in the shop, you know, you are hearing, you know, there's no room tone in the recording. You're hearing somebody in the neck, you know, things like that, because all these things ultimately matter in the, at the end of the day. So you need to know your stuff. You need to know your craft is important. You need to educate. Your, now, the other thing is you need to see what you're doing as a business. I was in Cannes with a bunch of colleagues and I was talking to a bunch of film sales agents from across Hollywood. And I was asking them, what do you guys think about Nollywood? The guy said, do you want the truth or do you want something as close to the, you know, like I said, just tell us. And he was saying, look, first of all, we don't even get what you guys are trying to say. In the first 10 minutes of the film, you're able to, you should be able to establish what the film is about, what the protagonist is about in the first act. In the 20 minutes, in the, you don't know where we are going. We, we are still trying to figure out where we're going to, you know, and things like that. So 
it impacts. So it, you you need to understand, like I said, you know, your craft. So it's really, really important. And that's and that's that's um that is something that is it's, it's really you need to understand that it's a business. A lot of filmmakers don't understand that filmmaking is a business. They, they go all the way to learn the technicalities. Okay, I'll get the best DOP, I'll get I'll shoot with the red camera, I'll get an Ari Alexa, etc. But you can't then you you're done making the film, but you can't sell it. The film is the film is out there two, three months, it's it's those there. You need to, beyond making the film, you need to be able to sell the film. And it involves education, understanding, you know, the tricks of the trade, what it takes to, what you, you know, how to look for a distributor, how to, what to tell a distributor, how to put together a film deck, how to put together information about your film, what your film about, break down who the film is for. So these are technicalities that a lot of us don't understand. You listen to, I've, I've, been, I've been in some pitching sessions and you listen to people pitch their film and they're telling you that the film is going to cost 200 million. But then again, they can't really explain the log line of the film and what is, you know, so things like that. So that's why I mean education. You have to understand what it is that you're making. It's very, very, very important. Then the next thing will be data intelligence. You can't go far without data. Data is new oil. I mean, everything runs on information. Where's the data? So you want, you know, you, you want to do a business plan and things like that. Where's the data about your, 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 your profit trajectories and what, how, you know, how is this going to work, you know? So information, information, get the data. It's very, very important, you know? And, you know, we have so many platforms where you can actually get the generate data from and things like that. So you must put data, put numbers, put, it's very important. These are things that people want to see. And I think that, you know, without saying too much, um, I think these are some key areas where I feel that a lot of focus needs to be on because I need to get the basics right, you know? You need to treat your, whatever you're creating as a product, whether it's a, a piece of music, whether it is a podcast, whether it's a book, whether it's a film, you need to understand it. You need to be educated on how to sell it and you have to understand the data to sell it and the data that it generates. So thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you very much for that rich, um, rich response. You know, um, it, it seems we can almost form a different uh, roundtable discussion just on that issue, that aspect alone. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bina. So, so very quickly, we'll move on to... Uh, our next uh, uh, Dr. Genevieve Bossa, um, who is our next um, speaker. Uh, I'll just quick, uh, give a quick uh, overview of her profile. Uh, Dr. Bossa is an academic and an experienced communications practitioner. She's a board member of the PRC Global Qualifications Board and a member of the CIPR Research Panel. Uh, she, she has a Prince II certified, she's a Prince II certified program manager and a published author from the University of Leicester. Uh, Dr. Bossa is a lecturer in media and communications and teaches both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. She is currently the Emmy coordinator for the journalism and media communications degree. Uh, we we'll, we'll put a longer profile for her on our LinkedIn. So, um, Dr. Bossa, very quickly, I invite you to take to the floor to give us your own thoughts and your perspectives on the subject matter before we uh, send a volume of questions your way. Oh, a volley of questions. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, lovely. I've just been listening in. I really enjoyed um, Andrea's talk and Obina's talk. Very interesting, especially hearing from, um, you know, practitioners. So thank you for that. And of course, it was lovely to hear about, you know, the um, knock art. So I'm from coming from the academic perspective and when I got this question, the first thought was, okay, hmm, are we talking about the Africa as a brand? Are we talking about multiple countries? Are we talking about individual countries? Because Africa is not a country, it's a continent and we're not homogeneous. So that for me started to pose some questions. But then if I'm teaching branding or if I'm talking about branding, I always want to look at the brand so it's it's something interesting let's see how we go then position repositioning where we're saying there had to be a positioning um, for us to reposition so where have we positioned ourselves firstly but i know i have just five minutes so let's see how far we can go i'd want to state that firstly there is a difference between rebranding and repositioning now, you can reposition and rebrand, but they are two different things. Oftentimes, rebranding can talk about cosmetic changes, you know, changing the attributes of a brand identity. But repositioning has to do with um, perception, you know, the perception adjustment of what the brand 
is, what you've designed the brand to be, how customers or consumers associate with the brand. So we go back to the original question, how was this brand repositioned in the first place? Then we can figure out how to reposition it. And from the two speakers, lovely, they, they, they basically they covered it. I'm just giving scaffolding language to most of what they've said, you know, more like academic terms. And the two in particular that I would just start off with. So when we're talking about repositioning, we want to look at the value positioning strategy, what you have promised. And Andrea mentioned that, and Obina also mentioned it, when we talk about a brand, is a promise. What are you promising people when they get your film, your music? What is the crux of what you're promising? Now, you could also look at it from a service positioning strategy. Are you given a service? Is it value? There's also a third one called the influence, influencer celebrity um, st positioning strategy. But if we just focus on the first two, value and service, that is key. To look at these first two, we then go into, okay, there are seven, but I'll just take three. Let's look at brand reflection. What is your brand re reflecting? If it's not reflecting an image that you are proud of, then you have a problem. That takes us back to the conversations about globalization, about colonialism, which people like to skirt around, or new colonialism that we have, and also the things that we're trying to project. The brand image or the brand domain where this brand, this African brand resides in, who is it competing with? What is it trying to, well, what are you trying to do? So you see a film, it's, the storyline is okay, but hello, okay, what, what are you trying to do? Where is the domain? Where does it sit? What is the reflection of the self image or the African image, or maybe the Nigerian image that you want to project. All these give you, I would say, <laughs> heart palpitations when I start to see them. And I always ask these questions about strategy. Now with the reflection and the self image, it leads us to the question of how do we see ourselves? If we see ourselves as always playing catch up, it will reflect in everything we do whether in film, whether in music, or playing second fiddle. And that is where the heritage then comes in. So we could either position from heritage, what is it about the heritage that you would want to share? Are you proud of certain parts of your heritage that you know can compete in the global space in this domain and actually not just compete, but also overtake? That is prominent. That is key. That, see, when, when I talk to certain my, my, some of my students and we look at projects and I give them examples of how they can use heritage to reflect their value positioning. It's amazing because they never always see it. So you see the customer perception or adjustment in perception. If we change our perception of how we view ourselves, how we want to reflect ourselves, then we have arrived at, okay, great. This is the kind of film I want to be proud of. This are the kind of movies or things I want people to see. In looking at it from an academic perspective, I've often struggled most times to see um, data, actually reach data, because there are people writing about it, but it's not always enough because there is no money. <laughs> We're talking about money for making the film. Oh my God, let's not talk about money for then doing the data because it's like, where was the value? But there is a lot of value. There is a lot of value in looking at how people consume these things. And if we have these conversations of how it is consumed. <laughs> Hi, Susan, do you want to contribute to the conversation? How it is. No, I think it's somewhere. Yeah, go ahead. So how people contribute to, to these to these things that we discuss, you know, so it's actually very helpful. So I've looked at the value, the value positioning, service positioning, and also we then look at brand, um, brand heritage, brand domain, brand personality. Oh, I was in data just before, yes. So I was looking at the data. If we're struggling with money, can you imagine how much data or how much research gaps exist because we don't have funding to look 
at what will benefit and what will drive these stories. Shocking. So be, uh, the, the, there, is, there is so much. Let's look, for example, at social network analysis or sentiment analysis. If we take a certain genre of movies and look at how over time things have changed, how it has shifted the perspective of people, how you go to East Africa and people are saying, oh, please, oh, oh you know, oh, please don't do this because they've watched it from Nigerian movies. You can then be able to track culture, language, and how these help to create, you know, some sort of movement. I remember somebody sharing this, and I always love to share it. When there was this movement or this exodus, or when people want to be brainwashed, they do it three ways. They do it, first of all, with what you read, philosophy, um, looking at the frontal lobe. The second way is through the creative industry. Um, movies, films, storybooks, because there you are able to suspend disbelief and they're able to tweak with your mindset, the thing in your mind. So it goes through the back. And then the second one is what you say. So if the philosophy, which is your, your service positioning is right, you put those into films, people start to say the same thing, speak the same thing, behave in similar ways. If our self-image is all about the bad stuff, all about voodoo, all about juju, all about this, all about this narrative that people have about Africans or Nigerians in certain places, we are combating, we can do rebranding all we like, change the cosmetic things. If we have not shifted from how it is situated first, the value we want to give, you know, what we are offering, the service, in terms of shifting perspectives, we will keep playing this, you know, this game and this dance. And I do agree that we do have um, people that have come into it because it's it's a it's a quick rise to I don't want to say fame in a way notoriety because hey it's a good way for them to come on board and shine. But there is no there is no plan to reorient the next generation. If that is forefront, then we have, we have, we're achieving milestones. If we can get the young people, if we can build a system that grows with the younger generation. So this is what the media does. The media looks at ages and grades of people, and we design things to grow with them. So you can have Dora the Explorer from when she was young, and Dora the Explorer is now in school. Dora the Explorer then gets married, and you know, they are growing with Dora. They are learning things about her. They are imbibing or imbuing a culture and a mindset in people. So if we want to reposition the African brand, we need to start to think about how we can start to reflect a self-image, a self-identity, to change perceptions about us, not just through storytelling, but also through value and through the service that we want people to do, and also to invest fund in research so for, from the academic perspective. Please give us money. Let us write about what is happening. Let us analyze how people are consuming this, where are they consuming it from? Okay, for example, if we were to do a research analysis on um, the kinds of, um, the modes of consumption, for example, are people watching it mostly on certain tabs, on phones? It is actually very important Then we can look at how much time is spent there. You know, at what point do they get these things? If they spend this much time on certain devices, what kinds of things, what is the attention span? I, um, am I able to then, you know, and that was where, you know, all these series started because we've moved from oh, longer movies to shorter, you know, the attention span starts to shift. Research helps us to understand this. We cannot always be using research from the Western world. We need to have our own set of research from us, by us, very important, because there is also bias in research. If somebody looks at the research without correctly understanding the content or the context in which it happens, you would have various, you know, readings that may appear right. Confirmation bias exists even in research, but then you would, it would never really grow. So with these few points of mind, I hope I've been able to... <laughs> 
to show you how. <laughs> okay, yes, so yes. yes, I will just I will just leave that here now and then. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very rich uh, presentation. With with these few points of yours, you've convinced us, you know, and um, um and enlightened our perspective on um the role of the creative um, industry in positioning uh, the African brand. So I, I, I took a lot from what you said. Um, and definitely from what you've, um, you know, you've been in academia, you know, and from your presentation, um, uh, one, thing I, one thing that stands out in your presentation is um, it was um, you, you took an evidence-based approach, you know, in presenting your perspectives and giving us some of the insights. So th there is definitely a rich uh, body of knowledge, you know, a rich body of literature, you know, on uh, some of these um, uh, uh, things you've said. You know, uh, one of the questions I have is, um, you gave the example of sentiment analysis. You know, uh, but for example, you know, um, you know, you can do a social media sentiment analysis to uh, uh, want to see uh, people's perspectives or opinions, you know, are, are people having negative sentiments or positive sentiments or neutral sentiments on, on, on what you're producing, on what you're bringing out from your industry and how, and how does that influence you to make more intelligence-led decisions, you know, in your marketing and, um, and, and um, what you're projecting. So, um, you know, sentiment analysis, you also talked about, um, the, there was another example you gave. So, so my question is, when you look at the academia, you know, uh, which you represent, the rich body of knowledge, you know, in terms of repositioning versus rebranding and some of these things. Um, and, and this does not only apply to Africa, you know, this is more like a global uh, kind of question. How, um, currently, is there a, a does the, the, the evidence, you know, and the, knowledge generated from the academia, do you have a very um, uh, streamlined and effective two-way transit? How, 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 how instantaneously and how well does uh, this uh, uh, knowledge, uh, body of knowledge, how well does it translate into what you see going on out there in the creative industry? You know, is, is there a connect? It's almost like the difference between technical communication and science communication where they say you have to go beyond just doing the research. How well do you see practitioners out there or, uh, or, or even in your own little space? Uh, what is the nature of interaction between your research and the practitioners? How well, how well uh, does this uh, research translate into uh, you know, the repositioning that we talk about or that's what a, more can be done? That's a really good question. And do you want the honest answer? Um, because, <laughs> not truly, because that is a key thing with research. Oftentimes, people are discouraged from doing research because it feels like, so, so what? You get people read it, but does it translate into things that can move industries forward? Does it actually translate into policy? So there, there has been a disconnect with research and practice. There has been. But I feel like it's moving now where the funding actually comes from the practitioners and they work together and you can see it in real time. This requires time because oftentimes <laughs> it, you would see that you need to track these things. So people often want immediate responses. You know, I'll pay you for this paper or I'll sponsor your paper. I want to, no, it doesn't happen that way. Let me give you an example. You know, fella, fella, sorry, you know, fella. Yes. <laughs> um, if you track from when he started or came out, there was a 10 year gap in the people that were watching him, that grew up with him and that have become a second part 2.0 of him. There's a 10 year gap. Research is where we study when they started. We have a baseline. They always bring research towards the end. That's the problem. We have a baseline. We start, we find out what caused these, what are the influences that helped to shape the current group of musicians that we have, the Whiskids, you know, the Burner Boy, and all the others. What happened? How do we then replicate that for 10 years? That is the problem. Oftentimes, 
there's, there's no patience to translate the research into actual products that people can use, but it is changing. So you would notice that most people that are coming into research are people, and I'm saying this to encourage people to come into research, please. Now, this is why people doing research now are doing it from a, a place of practice. I started out as a journalist on radio and I did a bit of TV. In research, I was able to bestride the two worlds. I was able to see the practice part, translate them into research and see how it can feed in. Because sometimes core academics are not able to speak the language of business that is required to translate what they're researching to impact the world. If you're researching on airlines, for example, you could just deal with the technical bits, it will fly well, it will stay this, and then the person's like, okay, so what? You always have to have a so what? So what in terms of value for people? So what in terms of service? So what in terms of consumer? Now, I go back to the beginning of the foundation of research, the audience. If you understand who your audience is, what your audience wants, where your audience are, or wherever you know, and then how you can reach your audience, half of your job is done. We always assume that we know what people want, but data will give you clearer insights on what they want, clearer insights. It's happened time and time again. Now, even with, oh, people love film. Who, 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 who are these people? It might be, oh, I've spoken to my friends and family. Great. Your friends and family, we also need to break down the question of who do your friends and family um, represent? Now let's look at the nitty gritty. What are the, um, what, what, what's the economic power of this group? Are they able to afford these movies? Are, are they able to, how can we translate this? So research gives us an idea of the granular detail of what we're working with and what we can do better, what we can do better. And I think that is also the part of repositioning. We're doing great. What can we do better? We can do things better when we have data and we have when we have, when we have data, when we look at the data, when we work with the data. So that uh, that for me, I think is um, one key question. And I do see that Dr. Mano says so. Uh, yes. Do we? How do we get them to read it? We invite them to the table even from the beginning as we are writing, because when they when we finish and then publish, the disconnect is. I, I get it, but it doesn't really speak to me. I'm, I'm a bit, you know, even the language sometimes can be off-putting, but if from the beginning we get people on the table, this is what we're discussing. Am I even researching something you think is important to you? Hey, that's number one. Are you researching things that people think are important? You might think it's important from an academic perspective. What about the practitioner perspective? As an academic slash practitioner, I like to scaffold and I like to um, give language to things that people some, sometimes already know and situated correctly in research. So I hope that helps. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very interesting one. Uh, so it's, it's uh, bottom line, our research should be participatory. You know, there should be uh, our, the public, it's, it should be citizen oriented, citizen centered research, you know, because when you do your research with uh, uh, with that uh, participatory approach, um, um, you'll be able to uh, uh, those who are the targets of your research will embrace uh, what they're bringing to them easily. And that brings me to a second question for you. When we talk about, um, I know that in academia, um, ethics is a big issue, and um, I know you had mentioned something about bias, you know, uh, for example, if we look at bias, you know, what are some of the things that influence them? Um, uh, if you look at our creative industry, our movies, our music, you definitely see different elements that bring in bias in what people put out. It could be political divides, it could be ethnic divides, it could be so many different things. And on a global stage, we will look at the uh, uh, racial divides, you know, um, you know, uh, where, for example, uh, you have uh, different countries having uh, 
conflicts or, or or race or different races, and those things can manifest even in the, the creativity. But my my key question for you in terms of uh, living bias coming to ethics is when we look at uh, what we put out there, you know, in terms of uh, our movies, our music industry, you know, the creative industry. Um, I know that those, I know that the practitioners are not very mindful of ethics the way, I don't think they are, the way you have in the academic, uh, in academia, you know. Um, but what are some of the ethical valuations you see? For example, if you talk about, um, um, I, I know there's sometimes, you know, in academic research, if you have a target population, you have to seek their permission to do certain things. You need to ask people if it is okay to project their information or project them in certain ways. And you need to be mindful of, um, of how your research, how it influences uh, people. What are some of the ethical violations you see in our creative industry? And how do you think, uh, uh, what, what do you think practitioners should be mindful about? Knowing that they, they are dealing with human subjects, they are not dealing with animals, or they are not dealing with um, um, equipment, you know, they are not dealing with inanimate objects, they are dealing with human human beings. What are some of the ethical violations you see and how can our practitioners be more mindful, you know, ethically? Oh, thank you, Chooks, for that. I'll just touch on bias first, just before I do this. I think bias is not a bad thing. People run away from bias. Bias is actually okay. But in research, if you're able to demonstrate where you sit and question your held bias and other people's bias, it gives you a more balanced perspective. So that is also the good part of research. It helps you to question your own bias and give you allowance to look at other people's perspective. In terms of ethical violations, uh, uh, I want to stay far away from that. <laughs> so many. But I would say that um, things are changing. I think there's a greater awareness of um, intellectual property theft that is happening now, so we could talk about that. There is also a greater awareness of sexual violence and how that can be portrayed um, online because it's very key. Now, I know that oftentimes the cues and the triggers are not as subtle as they could be because people have gone through this. And remember, this also stems from the domain where this sits. You can't, you can't really enforce certain things if you're living in a country where it's not even talked about. That's you're pandering to maybe the Western world in a sense. But if we start to introduce them through subtle cues, through certain things, and bring people, bring people to the awareness of these triggers, it would help a lot. So I feel, I feel like um, with with some of the trainings and the fundings that we talked about in you know, the earlier speakers, if we bring in ethical considerations, even like maybe like a short course, it will help. So that rather than reeling out, you know, or I watched this film, oh my God, do you know what they did? No, I feel it's changing. I feel there's a greater awareness about how to talk about certain things, how to gender differences. Oh dear, let's not even go there. That in a way can be a conversation started. Let's talk about the culture. So now it, it can be problematic because there are cultural differences even in a country like Nigeria, that if we talk about those cultural differences, they could pose some ethical issues. They are, they are religious things. So it's, it's, it's that awareness and talking about it from, you know, policy level, talking about it from um, even the production level, it then starts to trickle down. So remember when we said, you know, like I gave the example of Dora, when Dora was Dora when I was growing up, and now Dora is a big girl, if we start to position ethics and the understanding of, you know, some of these issues from there, where we need to start teaching children, for example, how to say no, if people want to talk to them or touch them inappropriate, there are things, I think uh, there was a music I heard one time, you know, that people, I can't remember the name of the singer, and people were like, oh my God, you don't talk to women that way. Great. Then you start to put that in songs and say, oh, you don't speak this way. It grows with people, you know, so it's a it's a thing that would happen over time. We need to be aware of the culture. We need to be aware of the context. We need to also understand that with ethics, ethics can be ethics can be. Um, um, 
no, I don't want to say tricky, but in a way tricky. So we, th these are things that people need to bear in mind, but there is growth, things are happening, things are changing, but great, some, some more work needs to be done. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for that response. Uh, just like you said, ethics is a tricky, um, it's a touchy issue too some, sometimes, you know, so yeah. So uh, uh, thanks a lot for uh, laying that foundation for us, uh, that uh, foundation to build on. Um, We'll quickly go to our next speaker, uh, Professor Nandi Madichi. Uh, is he, uh, Professor Nandi, are you here, sir? Uh, let me know if he's here with us. Yes, Chooks, uh, okay. I'm here, I'm here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, you're welcome. So I'll just uh, give you a quick intro. So, um, Fof is a, he's a professor, Professor Nandi is a professor of marketing and entrepreneurship at the Nandi Azikwe University business school in Nigeria. He's a research fellow at the Bloomsbury Institute London and has previously held academic po uh, positions in marketing and entrepreneurship at the Canadian, uh, Canadian University of Dubai and University of Sharjah in United Arab Emirates. He's a senior, senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy of England and Wales and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing and um, the Chartered Management Institute. Uh, he's an author and um, he has a read profile, so I'll just um, uh, allow him to uh, enter the stage and give us his own perspective, um, his own position on uh, the creative industry in Africa and um, its role in repositioning the African brand before we, uh, we launch our barrage of questions. Thank you, Chooks. Uh, I've been struggling for nearly one hour trying to get onto this uh, Zoom platform, which goes to show you some of the things that need to change. Okay. I'm actually uh, joining you guys from Kigali. We are a professor of marketing and entrepreneurship and the coordinator of the Center for Economic Governance and Leadership at the University of Kigali here in Rwanda. Right, I shared a link, my recent book, which is The Creative Industries and International Business Development in Africa, published in this year, 2022, just before the Chogam, Commonwealth Heads of Governments meeting here in Kigali. Uh, so that book, as the link I said, really check the charts, is available on Amazon, and it captures most of the um, narratives we've been, we've been discussing um, this evening. Uh, just to set the stage, uh, I just wanted to, do I have permission to share my screen? Because I'm an academic as well, just like Genevieve Bosa. Genevieve, by the way, are you related to Ben Bosa in the US? Yes. Right, okay, Ben Bosa is my uncle that I've ever met. He's been a mentor. Small yeah, world. I've been in touch with him. Yeah, let's catch up. Let's catch up after that. this uh, event. Absolutely. Uh, ben Bosa obviously set up a gallery. A gallery in Enugu recently with Sunday Chuku. Sunday Chuku is, is, the, is a very powerful uh, artist. He used, he's a metal metal um, artist and all that. So that that's actually leads nicely into my conversation here. Creative industries is not just music and movies. Yeah. So, Chooks, yes, do it, I have it, permission it, to share my slides? Because I it, want to show you PowerPoint yeah, slides. It, yes, so you can. You can. Uh, you can share your right. screen. So that we understand what the creative industries actually seriously entails. Yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, you have permission to right, share okay. from your side. Right, right. Okay. Right. Um, let's have a look. I've just pressed the uh, presentation. Yes, but we can it's see. It's showing. It's showing. Is it, it. Is, it, is it showing in presentation mode? No, it's it's showing it in the normal mode. It's uh, yeah, it's right, showing. Okay. It's showing it. So you need to switch to slideshow. Yeah, that's that's why I've clicked a few times. Right? Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Right. If you look at the left-hand column. You see the dimensions of the creative industries. Ranging from heritage, media, and functional creations. So, if you cut across the roles, not the columns this time, if you cut across the roles, for heritage, you have cultural size, traditional cultural expression. If you look at arts, you've got visual arts and performing arts. If you look at media, you're looking at publishing, print media, and of course, audiovisual. If you look at functional creations, you're looking at design, creative services, and of course, new media. So for those that think it's just all about music and, and, and movies, 
Now you know. So let me start bottom up. Functional creations, you're looking at design. Interior design, graphic design, fashion design, jewelry and toys are part of the creative industries. We're doing ourselves a disservice by ignoring these as part of the creative industries. When it comes to creative services, even architectural advertising, creative R&D, content create, uh, creators and rest of them are also part of the creative industries. If you look at new media, software developers, video games, digitalized creative content, including algorithms for, 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 for animation and, and you name it, are part of creative industries. Now, if you look at, let's, let's just look at Africa. Let's take one country, for instance, Nigeria. Besides the oil, what is driving the economy of Nigeria? Just take out the oil from the equation. It doesn't go beyond this box here. And that's creative industries, and that's why we need to take creative industries seriously. But that's my opening page. Looks fire on with your questions, your barrage of questions, as you as you say. You're thank, mute, you Jukes. Oh, okay. thank you very much, Paul. Uh, that was a nice, um, um, a nice one. Um, you've broadened our perspective on the. Um, uh let's say the branches of the creative industry and um that is very interesting uh, uh before i go on i just got the message from dr Wanko. uh dr Wanko, are you still there um i think he said he had to go uh, let me just clarify um uh dr Wanko, uh, are you with us Yes, I'm here. Uh, I need to leave. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I need to leave in 25 minutes. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, but it's okay. It's been wonderful presentations all through. I think I've learned a lot, and uh, thank you. Yes, can you give us um, uh, can you give us about five minutes? Then we'll come to you. Then we'll have your presentation uh, before you have to go. Okay. All right. No problem. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I will just ask a quick question to Prof. Yes, so um, uh, thank you, Prof, for enlightening our perspective and for uh, broadening our horizon, you know, on the uh, on the different aspects, you know, of the creative industry. So um, the, the, there is a lot that comes out from this, but I'm just going to ask uh, uh, one question for now. And there is this part that Mr. Obina talked about, you know, in terms of owning our narrative, and when you look at all these branches, you know, the visual arts, architecture, creative services, audiovisuals, all of these interact. It's a cycle, you know, the, 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 our cultural narrative and our narrative in Africa, you know, whatever narrative we're trying to, and heritage we're trying to preserve or project, all of these branches of the creative industry, uh, you know, it's like a cycle that, um, that uh, sort of, uh, um, revolves around our combined narrative. What role do you think the academia, you know, I'm looking at your own background, what role do you think um, those in the in the academics have to play in terms of helping to preserve and project our narrative? And, and I'll give you an example. We, we talked about, we, we, if we look at how um, history, um, was passed along, you know, in old times where uh, things were passed down by word of mouth and um, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of African history. And this is not just Africa, different parts of the world. A lot of things were, document were not properly documented, you know, of course, due to the, 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 tech the level of technology back then. And a lot of things have been lost over time. Now that we have the academia, and I know in, in academia, there is a lot of uh, publications that go on and a lot of, um, of uh, monographs and papers. How do you think, um, you know, we can advance that, um, that, um, that move to conserve or protect our narrative you know, as Africans? What role or what do you think the academia can do differently in terms of proper documentation, or, uh, or proper projection of that co combined narrative that we all talk about. 
it's, it's interesting. That's a very good question. You see, um, I when I thought I couldn't log on to this platform, I sent a video recording to uh, Emmanuel uh, Mogaji. Um, of course, um, now that I've had the opportunity, it's a good platform to give you some highlights from my recent book. Something that's missing and is disconnecting Africa from the rest of the world, the D world, diaspora. Don't take diaspora for granted. We have seen some of our artworks being head bronzes, being re that restitution stuff. Okay? returning things back to Africa. Six months down the line, where are they? Where are the artifacts? We have the capacity to actually seriously store these products, artifacts. Many years they've been stored in Europe. So we're trying to renegotiate the terms and conditions on how they actually made their way from Africa to Europe. It was under colonialism. So they were so-called stolen artifacts. Now we're negotiating because Africa, I don't know one country that actually preserve these artifacts into 50, 100 years. In my recent book, I captured two or three galleries. I mentioned Bruce on Abrapea, I mentioned Nike, Nike Davis. I mentioned, uh, I think, uh, Vita Chelarams. Vita Chelarams, most of these arts galleries are, are in Lagos. So talking about preservation of our history, and our narrative, not to mention other dimensions we're talking about, animation and games. There's, there's, uh, uh, Afri Africa has actually gone into the animation and games um, uh, sector, where the likes of Disney were harassed a small time player, Disney had to collaborate with them. Strategic partnerships were formed. They said, these are the words these guys use. We're going to kick Disney's ass. Yes. Pull it well, on them. And Disney decided to take them seriously. Nigerian movies that used to be shot on camcorders. Now on Netflix. Netflix is not well, a camcorder business. No problem, not not well, so the narrative well, has been, been transported into major, mega, serious platforms. So tell the stories, engage with the diaspora. I have a book chapter coming out in a few months, probably in, before the end of the year, on the Nigerian music industry, where I argued that Africa, there's no music industry in Africa. There's no film industry in Africa. Why? Because they don't operate like industry. These are fragmented. The fragmented spaces. Okay, Buna Boy won wins award. Oh, whiskey does that. Where's, where's the industry? Buna Boy whiskey. Okay, name them. You can count them on your fingers. We have an industry. Do we have structure? Where are the royalties? Where are the patents? Where's the intellectual property? What's the future of the upcoming generation? How do this plug into the SDGs, especially SDG 8 on decent work? The youth of today are very creative. Give them the opportunity to try. We haven't got the capacity we need to sort that out. So as an academic, I bring it into my classroom, interrogate the SDGs, bring them in. The conversation is about STEM moving on to STEAM. Where A in the STEM versus STEAM is the arts. The arts broadly defined as the creative industries. Bring that conversation into it. This needs to be sneaked in nicely through programs known as entrepreneurship, because entrepreneurship is a broad based interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary subject, actually, most of the business schools. I don't know, I'm so passionate about this particular topic, I can talk until Christmas. But I'll just stop there for now. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. That was uh, quite enlightening. You know, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, the way uh, it's a lot of what is happening tends to revolve around particular personalities, you know, and um, it's not really, um, uh, we don't really have that uh, collective structure or industry like you mentioned, you know, so I'm sorry, I'll have to save your questions maybe for some other time because um, there's a lot coming out of that. So let's quickly go to Dr. Wanko. Um, uh, Dr. Wanko, Dr. Izun Wanko is a research fellow at the Institute for Anthropology 
and African Studies at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz in Germany. Um, his research interests revolve around African and African diaspora, popular culture and performance. And he's a, he's a recipient of the African Humanities Program Dissertation Competition Award and postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, Dr. Wankwa, we welcome you to the stage. Please give us your uh, enlightened perspective. Uh, the, the, the last three speakers we're having are, are from the academia. So, uh, you know, the, yeah, the hello. Uh, yeah, okay, yes. okay. Go yeah, ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And I thank all the presenters. I've really learned a lot, especially from the practitioners. And thank you, Dr. Bosa, for that presentation. That was wonderful. Thank you so very much. And uh, Professor Madichie actually stated what I wanted to say, like talk about this industry. Where is this industry we are talking about? But again, I think uh, what I wanted to say had been said by everybody else. So I will just say a few things. And the first one is, First of all, we have to pat ourselves at the back. Like Nollywood has really come a long way. We have to ask ourselves, how did it start? Like before now in the 1960s, I have a, a background in theater studies. And uh, in the 1950s, we had the, the Duroladi or all those people doing uh, stage performances. And uh, by the 1980s with the SAP uh, structural adjustment things, uh, we lacked funds to have these conventional kinds of performances come up. And then that's when uh, uh, the things like Nollywood came up in the 1990s, early 1990s, using ordinary camera view. Even before it came out, I grew up in Onicha. And I remember we have these pirated movies that we are watching, you know, these VHS tapes where they uh, take pictures and paste it on these things. So we have to understand these histories, to understand where we are coming from, and to understand that the idea of using video video to actually shoot these movies was, was innovative at the time it came. So I think it's something that needs to be commended. And for academics, yes, we do a lot of things. I remember uh, in the past, a lot of academics uh, people who studied uh, movies and films, we are not interested in studying Nollywood. It was until this American Jonathan Hines came and studied it, and then people became interested in it. Which actually leads me to what I wanted to talk about. Uh, uh, my study in the past couple of years have been on Nigerian stand-up comedy. And we've talked about Nollywood, we've talked about Nigerian music, but uh, stand-up comedy or comedy generally, both the one you see on stage and the ones they do on social media, uh, has, have always been uh, I think they are part of the kind of cultural exports that Nigerians have been given. Uh, interestingly, uh, my recent study is about a couple of non-Nigerians who are now taking up roles on social media as Nigerians who are using Nigerian popular culture. And I think this shows us uh, in certain ways or in, uh, in several ways that what we are doing is actually getting out there. People are becoming interested. In 2020, there's a young Russian girl that came to Nigeria known, known as Ibo Malian. She was attracted by the dance step, the Malian dance step, and she came to Nigeria to do comedy. Today, we have several of them. We have so many people who are doing these things, who are replicating Nigerian popular culture, doing lip sync, doing a lot of things on social media, on TikTok. There are so many of them to show that what Nigerians are doing or what the creative industry is doing out there is very interesting. I actually wanted to talk about stand-up comedy a little bit, uh, but I don't seem to have the time. I'm so sorry I had to run uh, because we are one hour ahead and I need to go somewhere at six. So, but uh, I wanted to talk about stand-up comedy because it's always very ignored or neglected. And I, I noticed that everything we've said about uh, movies and about these other things, nobody talked about stand-up comedy. But uh, stand-up comedy actually exemplifies the very thing that Professor Madiche was talking about. And that is, where are these industries? We have individuals who are paying through their pockets. We have individuals who are sponsoring these things. <laughs> And by sponsoring these things, uh, we claim to have an industry, but we seem not to have the structure on ground to have these things running. Because some of the things we claim are actually efforts done by individuals. Uh, Kunla Afonoya did, did a movie. That's his self-effort. Whatever funds he got, he got it by himself and he tried to do these things. And those people who fund these productions determine uh, what content goes into these, uh, these productions. And then look at stand-up comedy, for instance. Nobody seems to have noticed that women do not thrive on the stage. Does it mean that women are not funny? 
we had uh, at the beginning in the 19, late 1990s, we had people like Mandy. We had Mandy, we had Lepashos Bosse, who at a point started to take slimming drugs or whatever and had to slim down. And every joke was this kind of self denigratory thing where they talk about being, uh, being, uh, uh, forgive my words, fat, and then being, uh, you know, all those kind of things. And somehow they seem to be uh, fizzling out. And you find it looks as if women are not funny. But remember our mothers are actually one of the funniest, some of the funniest people we knew growing up uh, because they had funny tales to tell us. The fathers never had our time to tell us any stories. And, and then you find out that these people don't come on stage. It's because of how these things are produced. Who are the people behind? You have AY. It's only if you are favored by AY that you get on his stage. You have uh, other people. At the time, it was Night of a Thousand Laps. And uh, uh, yeah, that was telling uh, that decides who goes on stage. And these situations were not favorable to women. And that's why when internet performances came up, you find out that the people who became successful on social media were actually women. So because you have this platform for self-expression where you have to run into this thing and express yourself. I'm sorry, this is coming so disjointed because I'm so in a hurry. Uh, yeah, but you find this, they, they've taken up this mode of self-expression where they actually pass these things out. Now, I, I have a note which I have not been using since I started, but the other thing I wanted to talk about is that when we talk about African culture, we have to be very careful. Uh, in my study, we seem to have this notion that culture is fixed, but culture is not fixed. Culture is actually dynamic. It changes all the time. When we see African culture, I don't I'm know what African culture because what it was last year is not what uh? it is. And it keeps changing all the time. What we call pre-colonial African culture, when, where, what are we talking about? Somebody stated at the beginning that Africa has over 54 nations. And within these nations, we have different cultures. So this idea of Western imposed homogeneity of Africanness or African culture. We should be very careful with that because there is a lot of things coming out from Africa which uh, actually add variance with each other. So, uh, sorry, I'm so disjointed, but I, I just wanted to contribute to the ongoing, uh, very rich uh, discussions that we've had, we've had so far. And um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, uh, thank you so very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, do you have time for one question before you leave us? Okay, yes, I have nine minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. okay. So um, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation and for also um, talking about, you know, um, you know, the comedy industry, you know, and all of that, the stand-up comedy industry. So just like we have in the normal, in other um, other se uh, aspects of the entertainment industry, you know, many people who we've seen, you know, that many people, many men, let's talk about the men who get into comedy. Sometimes, yeah, it's, they get into there by circumstance. Sometimes it's people who had unfavorable uh, upbringing and then they use the, they, they resorted to humor to try to uh, help them out with all of that. How do you feel that um, uh, we can be much more intentional in cultivating that comedic talent at, uh, for for people for both men and women that are at a young age, so that it's not only because if you look at if you break down a lot of the jokes they bring out, they talk about the struggles they face and how all of that. So uh, so how can we have people who are actually from the grassroots actually through positive experiences or through positive ambition want to go into stand up comedy? And it's not only people who through negative circumstances, you know, and that and that also works on the women too who might be more endangered in that in an exploitative environment. So how can we have a grassroots transformation in those who go into grassroots comedy, into comedy, I mean, into stand-up comedy? Thank you so very much for that question. This is uh, an omnibus question. There are so many things in it, but I will answer it this way. The first thing is, in the 1980s and early 1990s, before the stand-up boom, nobody was interested in being a comedian. Nobody wanted to be a joker, the, the joker of the community. It, no, it was the success that people like Ali Baba, AY, when they became successful, that people started getting into comedy. Even in the past, nobody wanted to read performance or read theater arts. Nobody wanted to be anything to be the people's joker. Nobody wanted that. 
it's the success that this, I, I think there's a joke that Alibaba told a joke. He said in his community that everybody uh, was, uh, every father wanted to have a lawyer in the family in case there's a land dispute somewhere. And then he was to study uh, law and his father, he wasn't able to do that. He did something else. And his father told him, now nah, I learned that you have become Alibaba. I will never call you Alibaba. And he said, so in, in, you know, he was one of the people that professionalized the industry. And he said he bought a Mercedes car for his father at one time, and he brought it to him. He said, as soon as he drove it into the compound and handed the key to the father, the man was like, Ali Baba. <laughs> and this was the same person who said he wasn't going to go. So you see the success that these people have registered actually draw people, even people who are not even talented in the industry, getting into the industry. That's one part. The other part I want to talk about is that people laugh at jokes without, without actually realizing how jokes are made. Jokes are not nice. Jokes are not meant to, yeah, you laugh at them, but it's the process through which we are amused that we are also offended. There's no joke, there's no funny joke that is nice. You know, it, the jokes don't make you look good. They make you look terrible. Is, so, but, but it's the environment of the joke that we discuss serious matters playfully. So I can tell you that you have, a, tell, not you, sorry, tell somebody that the person has a body odor through jokes. But when it's serious matter, you can walk up to somebody and say, man, you smell. That's offensive. But in jokes, you'd be like, bros, buy perfume now, right? <laughs> so jokes are not nice. That's one thing. The second thing is that jokes are oftentimes made up. You know, we, we see the novelist as somebody who creates story. We see the, the movie maker as somebody who creates story. But we also fail to see that comedians also make up some of these stories, all right? And because they are present in the, in the narration, we always see what they say as their personal opinion, which is not always the case. So sometimes when a, nov a novelist can, when we read Tim Amanda Adichie's novel, we don't know what the character that represents her opinion, right? When we read, yeah, when we watch a movie, we don't know the, it might be the most terrible of the characters that you call antagon, antagonist that represents what the, what the writer wants to portray, right? But because the comedian is there, present in the joke, right? Standing there saying these things, and they have to say it in a convincing way to make you believe it so that you can laugh. Because if you don't believe it, you can't laugh. There are a lot of intricacies there. So uh, let me just cut it short. I don't know if I'm answering your question, sorry. But uh, let me just say that everything boils down to having a structure in the society. When you don't have a, a creative industry structure, it's not anybody's fault. Nigeria is a place where people just struggle on their own, right? It's so when you want to make a movie, you struggle on your own, get your money and make the movie. You want to be a stand-up comedian, you struggle on your own, find your contacts, even to be an academic. You struggle on your own to find your contacts to become an academic, to come to go to South Africa, go to anywhere to study. You have to struggle on your own to get there. So there are no scholarships, there are no grants for performers, there are no uh, industries for us to go. Somebody mentioned earlier that South Africa has this uh, this uh, uh, something they have that they attract you to come and shoot movies in their country. And do we have that in Nigeria? So, and I've, uh, I've actually talked about Nigeria specifically because, uh, uh, yeah, because that's what connects most of us here. And there's one other thing, one other thing, the use of Pidgin English in stand-up comedy, the use of Pidgin English. You know, Pidgin English is one language that we seem to neglect, but that's one of the best unifying languages that we have around our country. And we neglect this in our stand-up comedy keeps pushing it. So, so, sorry, sorry, I have to run. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for the opportunity. Thank that you was so very, much. The, 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 yeah. That was very informative. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, I have yeah. to run. Thank you very much. I, yeah, I really enjoyed myself. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. yeah, safe trip and regards to your family, sir. Thank you so very much. We'll talk later. Yeah, bye. OK, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so I, I, I've been the one asking Sorry, all Chuk, the questions. So, Chuk, can I come in? Yes. Can I come in on the last point you made? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead, sir. Right. So, in my in my research on the creative industry, especially the the uh, Nigerian music industry, I did mention in English. 
and when it comes to the role of the media, even the Guardian, the UK Guardian has chronicled in English as a unifying force, as a language that comes across a population of over 200 million people. So that's, that is very important. There's a term that is used in the creative industries. It's called code switching. When you listen to any Afrobeat artists, they don't speak just one language. They speak Kings and Queens English, Pigeon English, Yoruba or Hausa or Igbo. They bend them. So they keep switching codes. That resonates with a diverse audience, very diverse audience. And that's what's them where they are. Uh, it's, it's surprising that uh, even Ed Sheeran, when he did a uh, couple of uh, collaborations, was speaking Pigeon English. Ed Sheeran, from West London. Think about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. That's um, a, a nice uh, uh, response you gave. Um, I've been the one asking all the questions since we started. So I'm going to, can we take one or two questions from our audience? Um, I will just leave it open to, if you if you have a question for any of our panelists, you can just unmute yourself and ask them. Uh, after this, I will invite the president of Samurai to give, uh, to thank our speakers and give the closing remarks. So uh, one or two questions, uh, anyone? Okay, it seems I've done justice to the Q&A session. So I will now invite um, Dr. Emmanuel Mogaji to um, give us, to thank our panelists and to give us uh, uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Uh, I thank you, Chooks. It's been a pleasure listening to the conversation and listening to, uh, to the discussion around this. Uh, I guess it's just for me to really appreciate uh, all the speakers. Uh, thank you so much for your understanding, irrespective of the uh, technical difficulties we had right from the beginning. Thank you so much for, for, for your patience and importantly for your understanding and also uh, joining this conversation. I think we need to recognize the values in having this conversation and raising awareness about the creative industry. Right from uh, the first speaker, like talking about the, the Nollywood, uh, the Netflix and the Amazon coming on board, what are they really doing? Are they really helping us to shape this narrative or they have their own agenda to push a different movie uh, genre for us? But ultimately, uh, we want to recognize uh, the roles of the of the movie makers in shaping this this narrative, and also even up to talking about research. Uh, thank you again to uh, our our res researchers. Yes, I'm so much happy we've got a mix of both the practitioners and also the researchers for us to recognize the fact that we can't just be doing this research and people not using it. But also we can be doing things and not getting some research and to empirically validate some of those uh, information that's coming across. And lastly, I think I want to appreciate the comment around the, the, the comedians. I think that was very valid point and perhaps a way to close this conversation. I made a point that uh, social media has really opened opportunity, has really uh, provided a level ground for the female comedians. And it's not surprising that even some male comedians are trying to dress like female because they also want to appeal to that audience. So I think we recognize the, the dynamics and perhaps closing with this idea of the pidgin language. Again, for me, I see it as the unofficial official language where Professor Madiche was saying, this is a language that is unifying about 200 million people. And even don't be surprised, people in other parts of Africa not even Nigeria, we're talking about this, uh, this language. So thank you so much for everybody that has participated. So SEMRI is a group of uh, individuals with diverse research interests. And that is why we often try to have these roundtable discussions to bring ideas that perhaps cut across all Africa. So we've talked about education, talked about transport. Last month, we talked about, uh, uh, about uh, sports. So we recognize that we need to have this discussion, perhaps maybe coming from research, but also to see how this can be applied in, 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 in real life. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us. Yes, I know many of us are meant to be somewhere today. Even me, I should be somewhere, but I said, you know what, I have to be here as well to join this conversation. I've really enjoyed myself 
perhaps just taking uh, following the conversation. I'm not really into creative, but I was able to follow the conversation. So thank you so much, Achooks, for hosting us and Dr. Mary as well. Thank you so much for the for the engagement and uh, dealing with the Q and A's. So that will be all from my side. I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear president. Uh, we'll follow up with our speakers. Um, Samurai will uh, send certificates of appreciation to all our speakers and uh, more updates will follow. Thank you everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Cheers. Bye everyone. It was really nice Thank meeting you. Much. you. Bye. It yeah. was. Oh, nice meeting Genevieve. you. I will yeah. be in touch. Oh, please. <laughs> I, oh yeah, Jennifer, I'm happy, happy, happy to be touched. Nice I to meet you. Know. I was like, yeah. oh my God. Nice to meet you, Dr. Namdi, definitely. Dr. Namdi, thanks everyone. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm saying hi and goodbye from London. <laughs> oh, yes, hey, bye bye. I'm so blessed to have come yeah, on today. I'm um, a BAFTA award-winning drama producer. Fantastic, oh my God. And wow. um, oh, I was part of the British Film Institute delegation Nigeria so I thought let me follow this up wow. and I'm it's been amazing really interesting wow. and I'd like to leave you guys with this at the moment there is so much interest in um, content coming out of West Africa especially huge interest so at some stage when you have another one of these I'll come on and I'd love to share but honestly, I've been listening and I kept on wanting to say television streamers. That's the future. You know, film Thank you for leaving us on streamers. Yeah. It's, it's the future and they know it. That's why Amazon and Netflix are there and Canal Plus are there. And it's, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. So hopefully mm. at some stage, what will happen is we'll be co-producing. Yes. So much. Definitely. That's all right. Thank you so much for leaving us with that. I guess that could be another conversation for another round table. Yes. yes. Definitely. It, it's yeah. good Barbara really mentioned really that in closing. And that was why I yes. mentioned it earlier. People don't realize, yeah. like we have this conversation, but a great majority don't know that that's the trickle in. And that mm. some people are hearing, so you hear Amazon now, they've been preparing to go into Nigeria over the past 12 months. Definitely. So I've mm -hmm. said Paramount Plus, a lot of people don't know it. And this includes some producers, well, a lot of producers mm -hmm. in Nigeria. So when they yeah. arrive, there's a rush yeah. of what they want. Yeah. But they planning this time next year, Paramount Plus will be in Nigeria, but they are already yeah. planning. Disney yeah. has been planning over 18 months yeah. But they're going to arrive with Black Panther, which they will launch at Africa. And there's yeah. a lot more. And so we kind of, the, the struggle, I think, and I'm just, I just wanted to say this. There was so much I wanted to say, but where a lot, and I'm listening to everybody, is this, what Obina was saying, and Genevieve did mention it, and Barbara is igniting it, is we're carried away with our differences as opposed to how we collaborate to make this. No, so um, there's a, a TV show I just um, consulted on. It's on Showmax. It's called DJ. And it's all mm. about getting the culture right. It's part Ebo, the words right. And well, it's a TV series. It's a short series. I know that we get carried away with, oh, who's going to be on whose platform? But it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be you versus me or us versus them. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, working absolutely. together is the goal here. And if we yeah. work together, that's how we get in front. That's how we get ahead. And that's how we create the change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's it, really. It, 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 wow. Kelechi Amadi, be the famous photographer, told me yes. something when I was a junior art director. He said, sometime in 2007, he said, the sky is too big for two beds to collide. Think about that. <laughs> He's, every shoot I've done with him, he says that and he, you know, because there is a different. I think our also our problem per se at the back mm -hmm. is that people are terrified of not being seen. I know I've been mm -hmm. in, in rooms with directors and producers, 
who used to be directors and producers when I first started acting in the 90s would say, oh, they know your name, they know your face, but they don't know I made you. So there is now mm. a confusion. Mm. It's true. I know, mm. I know. It, 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 there is a confusion of they know your faces, but they don't know us. And I always mm. say, Steven Spielberg couldn't bother. Mm. He wouldn't be bothered with you seeing his face. Do you know why? And he mm. says it at every interview. It's not about him. He goes, all I really that do is, work. okay, let's take the shot. It's exactly. about my team. And I'm the working team, with yeah. the same people. I take them wherever I go. I expand. I pay more because they give me everything. And they're loyal to our projects and what we do. So I would rather mm -hmm. pay my team more than reach out outside. And I would rather they develop more. So mm -hmm. it, I, I think sometimes there is the carry away. And uh, uh, one of the doctors before was saying, where are the royalties? As much as I know that there's a lot of issues with royalties in Nigeria, I have to say I was the first, I was at least one of the first people who received royalties in Nigeria from Fuji House of Promotion, from Amaki, mm. late Amaki. She paid us royalties. I don't know about any, what any so when you hear sometimes wow. in Nigeria, you hear wow. it can be done. How do we do it? It can. It it's was can. done in the 90s. It yeah. was done in the early yeah. 2000s. It can be done. It's, it actually can yes. be done. Yeah. It's just that, again, people don't want to share. They don't understand collaboration. They feel like, mm -hmm. oh, why do I get 40 when I can get 100%? Yes. Get 40 or something that is Absolutely. good than, 40, than 100% of what's mediocre. Do. You understand? And um, it's great that Barbara said mm. something and er because sometimes mm. also we feel lost as in you do mm. know what you want to mm. do or you do know mm. how you want to collaborate or what you have to bring on the table. Mm. But a yeah. lot of the time also, like Obina would have experienced because Obina knows, <laughs> I know Obina's story, is that people don't want to hear how you can do it right. Yes. They don't want to take the time. And I used to be angry about it, but finally, if you think about it from the business side, this is why. A lot of them are funding themselves from their pockets. They're thinking of their children's school fees, their house rent or mortgage. Some of them have families who live in England or America and they're in Nigeria struggling. So for them, it is not the time to think about how to do it right. It's about what do I put in this picture to Absolutely. just make it sell and make my money and pay Survive, those bills. Yeah. So the more we get the balance in terms of funding and people getting paid well, because that is what creates in the industry. When you know mm -hmm. that you're going to do this job as an actor and the minimum pay for you is $10,000, then you know you're able to plan around that salary. If you get speaking roles, these are the things yeah. that help. Everybody is watching and they, I hear when they say, oh, we do things fast. But that's what everybody is doing now in Hollywood. I remember when I went to producing <laughs> school and I remember us doing our test and they, go, they kept going, oh, you have to. I said, just tell me what it is I'm supposed to produce. Lead me to it. Mm. And I remember mm. I, I eventually when we finished school, they used to joke about how, oh, no, go ask Andrea. She'll tell you the way around it. Because... I will do the job. It might not be the way you're used to doing it. And that's because I come from where we make things work with what we have. So this not, it's not mm. horrible. The Chinese have their own way. The Indians have their own way. It's about really? doing it, then collaborating mm. with how to get it on the right platforms, doing the stories that people are willing to watch about us, but still about us, mm. you know. But there's so much we can have conversations about on this. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Obina. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. For I met some came. BFI uh, when they came. Um, I met Yemi. I think there's a guy called Yemi who was part of your team. who's a friend of mine. Uh, we met and a bunch of other people. Uh, when you guys came like a month ago to, to, to um, uh, NIFS. The, yeah, the, the, yeah. Okay. I didn't come, but I was connected and yeah. I did the okay. online one before. So I'm, I'm yeah. smiling because since then, I have never yeah. had so many ideas pitched to me <laughs> by <laughs> Nigerian. Nigerian, <laughs> that, that is us. You know, it, you know how we been. do it. You know how we do. We're going to come. We're going to come correct. You know how we are. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you what. It has been such a great experience because it has felt very collaborative. 
Mm. And we share ideas and I'll say, ooh, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Have you tried going this way? And then they're coming back and saying, oh, my God, I've had it optioned here or I'm going to. And because I'm coming at it from a different I Yep. Wait, you know, I will yep. sort of say, have you thought about co-producing this with South Africa, get the tax breaks in Canada, and then maybe, you know, and somehow it's kind of working and we're continuing. But mm. I think that it is about actually thinking about domestic industry collaborating to re for a um, reach an audience reach that's global mm. and at the moment there is a, a real market for authentic voices mm. Mm. and I think it's capitalizing on that because you know we won't go into it too much but I think everybody's probably aware of the debate around woman king yeah I actually have it on here pulled up the numbers of what there you go is what it did in Nigeria, the 10 top 10 countries outside of the United States, Nigeria is one of them. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, in terms of sales, box office for the weekend. Yeah. So, and that is because I told people, I said, you see, as a child growing up back in the seventies and eighties, as you grow, every time you watch something and he says a Nigerian person, yeah. Oh, that Nigerian prince. He's coming. I said, nobody talks like that. No, like, no, I have a British accent no. and, I have, uh, 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 and I have a Nigerian accent. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like anything I had when I was growing up. Who is that? A Nigerian prince. Oh, do you want to take money? And sometimes it's- Wait, you think of money. Wait, ah, ah, you do not yeah. hear. Oh. Because yeah. it, is, it is a Nigerian, um, either somebody who is of a Nigerian descent or a Nigerian that is made to speak this way. And I said, but that person, I know that person. How like you let them say that right? to you? And, you? and then you remember when I then started making my own films, I understood yeah. how an actor can find themselves in that space. But you see, the thing that happened with the Woman King, as in with PJ, really, because people know. say John Boyega, yes, John Boyega, but John is mostly British from the Nigerian British. perspective. But you see, in certain PJ in that film, they still don't even understand because for the Nigerians, Omo, Egomi, my bros, ah, th that's all they're thinking when they see that film. Even people who can't afford it will go watch it because he's in it. And then when he enters, listen, he represents everything you want to see in a Yoruba guy mm -hmm. and plus, and when he opens his mouth, mm -hmm. it is the language we understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I say the same thing as to when they prep, show Igbo people or women. And then this thing of, uh, there is no, we have courage, we have language. There is no need to cover that all of Africa is what we're not. We are Africans, but we don't speak the same language. Let's yeah. stop with yeah. that, okay? Yeah. When you hear South Africans speaking, you appreciate it. Like sometimes I know because of my South African friends, uh, I try and I love it. You know, but you love it when you're watching it and you hear the clicks and clanks and when they're talking, it enables you relate to, oh, that's South African. Mm. Oh, that's, you know, but about time <laughs> as a Nigerian, you can watch something and go, oh yeah, oh, finally. I was like, oh my God, thank you, finally. And yes, um, I remember Viola Davis was saying, this nearly wasn't made. This, mm. you know, cause this was on a chance. And would it happen? And if it does happen, if it doesn't sell, nobody will ever touch this again. And, and I'm so happy that it did very well and it's still doing well. And so hopefully this opens doors. A it lot. is brilliant. It is yeah. brilliant. The only thing is that it would have been great if the writers... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. the writers, and that will happen. That will happen. You know, but I think that's where the kind of collaboration comes in. Yes. You know, that we can, so as I say, with the Nigerian um, producers I'm working with, they, we will, I will say, can you give me five directors of photography, please? Yes. Or can you, what writers, female yes. writers from this, you know, um, what 
demographic are they working with in terms of music? Can you give me any kind of clues on the algorithms for the reach of that particular, yes. you know, kind of um, musician, etc. cetera. Yes. And sorry, it's getting dark here. I'm in it's London, a, you can tell. A, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and that's that's great. I think the more collaboration and the more co-production, it will happen because it's, it is inevitable. It is inevitable because whereas, you know, over here, the BBC, bless them, um, I'm ex-BBC, so OK. Um, but the, the audience demographic is much, much older. Whenever you sit in meetings where they're dis discussing, you know, I'm no good at algorithms, but, you know, that side of things and audience, audience reach, constantly West African demographics are presented because it's the youth, the young, you know, it is getting younger and younger. So where is the audience going to be? You know, and there is this kind of, it's finally landing that in order to make um, or monetize content, the diaspora has to be recognized, but the global market has to be recognized. Yeah. Because it's not the UK and yeah. it's not France. I mean, as you probably know, you know, some of the most um, successful television content is made from, uh, um, well, obviously, from Southeast Asia, but the collaboration between Turkey and the Latin market. Yeah. Now, people yeah. don't know that the Turkish producers are out there collaborating and making so much content, but they're yeah. not even interested to come and have a meeting in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I would say, Barbara, don't, don't, because I have been Nigerian and working, listen, don't give up. Don't um, hang in there. It, it some days will feel a bit awkward, but please don't give up. I know um, I, I used to do Afrif with Kichiri and the Amara Award to Kichiri. And I know that sometimes you go, ah, this isn't how, but don't give up. Um, we're a peculiar people and sometimes too many and it can be self-pushing as opposed to community pushing but you do have from all you said you do have an understanding of the people somehow and you're working it you know in little pockets which is the best way to work when it comes uh to Nigerians. so but yeah brilliant and i'm here in the uk so anything that uh um that we can work on anybody i'm here uh, just give me a shout and we can work together. Mary just asked a question saying, do we have a, a unifying culture which we could use to create content that would be Nigerian and not be a particular tribe? Of course, of course. Uh, the problem you tend to have, Mary, I said this at the beginning, is the fund. So whether we like it or not, this is how Nigeria is structured, unfortunately. If a Yoruba, if a wealthy Yoruba man or company is funding your film. He wants it to have more undertones of Yoruba. It's not him not being Nigerian. It's just, it's the way Nigeria is structured. It's the same thing with an Igbo man. If the money is coming from an Igbo marketer, he wants you fundamentally to, to be more about where he's coming from. But if we do have, which is what I said about funding, if the fund is coming from somebody who is more about, oh, the Nigerian culture, there are so many stories that you can do that inculcates or unifies our cultures, because we all have similarities anyways, in terms of Africa, not just Nigeria. We have similar, uh, similar moral understandings, family uh, um, keepings and how people raise their family. So those things are not so different. Like Genevieve, Genevieve is a Bosa. I, they've called her surname in so many ways is Bosa. My grandmother would smack me in the head if I didn't say that. But yeah, and I, I know your family because my mom's on it. So it's, it's yeah, your face just clicked the minute I saw you. That's how you, your face and your family is like that, yeah. So, um, but what I would say is, is like how in Igbo land, Onicha people tend to feel like they are different from Igbo people, but they speak Igbo. Yeah. It's just that diff, the only tweak difference that people don't realize until they speak to you is that Onicha women are raised independent. So yeah. Onicha women are enabled 
to feel like they can be the boss in their home. It yeah. doesn't have to be your husband. And if a marriage isn't working, come home. You're told that from when you're leaving your house. If it doesn't work, there's always home. Alternatively, people who are core evil, Enugu, Imo, when you go to your husband's house, he's there, you're yeah. done. There's no coming back anywhere. Your mother warns you, as a matter of fact, do not at all costs stay there and pray. Go to God, if you will. But home, who's going to be the laughter in the community? Me? Never. So it's just little nuances. But if we, if we take the time, like Jennifer has been saying in terms of research, and we check when we're writing a story, there are similarities that we can use yeah. to unify ourselves in stories. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh my God. No, All right, guys. Is, yeah. It's been great, awesome, <laughs> fantastic. Let's connect. It's been I great. know. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank I think you. we follow yeah. up, perhaps continue this conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been sure. a great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.